fellow blenders and welcome welcome to episode number 298 of real blend a podcast i can't believe some idiot drafted madam webb who did that oh i oh. forgot about that <laughs> yeah that one's gonna hurt <laughs> friends did you see what the rotten tomato score is whatever it is it's gonna go lower i think what? it was 23 when i looked. yeah i would say last i looked it was 23 which seems generous this is uh, we have a fantasy movie draft. I, don't, I forget what episode it is, but you guys should dig back through and find it where we all draft movies. And then Gabe is going to plug it and uh, uh, and pick the ones that we think are going to do really well on Rotten Tomatoes. And this clown. Right and here. Sean O'Connell picked the Aaron Rodgers uh, uh, so of Cinematic 2024. <laughs> Four plays <Holy>. in. <laughs> Holy <crap. laughs> 75 seconds into the game. All right. We have a couple of movies to review, uh, including Madam Webb on this week's show. And director S.J. Clarkson uh, is going to join us to discuss her latest film, which is a entry in the corner of Sony's Spider-Man universe that doesn't have Spider-Man in it. Um, I'm Sean O'Connell. I'm the managing editor of Cinema Blend and a co-host of the Royal Blend podcast, joined, as always, by Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. He's wearing his... Red-ish Spider-Man suit today, Maroon? Which Maroon? is weird, because I, I, I want to say last time I recorded, because I missed last week, and I want to say two weeks ago, I may have also been wearing this suit. That's a um, sharp suit. I, I promise I own others. It's just a, it's oh, just a very specific, it's a very specific suit to have on twice in a row. To discuss Madam Web, you have, a, it's their Spider-Man-esque colors with the black and the white and the red. You can't really see, nice. but on the back, it's a giant Spider-Man logo. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with Jake's quote for Across the Spider-Man. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, the, the only thing worse than, than wearing a suit is being reminded that tomorrow is Valentine's Day and and, mm. re, and realizing oh, that yeah. like this is the suit I probably should have worn tomorrow, but it's <laughs> what it is. In the other chair is Kevin McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. How are you? Hi. Hi. I'm still a little upset about the Niners losing, um, but I'm, I'm getting I'm getting through the day. Just kind of wanted that McCaffrey uh, uh, MVP and everything. But, you know, Mahomes does what Mahomes does. Hey, what was your favorite Super Bowl trailer? Did you have one? Oh, hands down. I mean, so I will say this. Deadpool 3 uh, was the one I was most looking forward to. The one on television I did not like. Um, obviously, the one that went to the web was much better and much more yeah. interesting and R-rated. Um, Still wanted yeah. a Wolverine shot, though. I know they're Me holding too. off. I would have liked one. For people out there, this is an interesting thing. I know we got to move on quickly, but people are uh, some people tweeted about this online about why they didn't show Wolverine, because for people who haven't seen it yet, at the end of the trailer, there's this awesome shot of Ryan as Deadpool laying on a rock and then Wolverine walks up as a shadow and then goes in, which is awesome. The one thing I forget to think about sometimes is we live in a bubble. So film Twitter, uh, if you've been following it, has been full of leaked photos of Wolverine mm. and Deadpool walking around. So we as and on Twitter know what he already looks like. I think the reason they don't show him in the trailer is because the general audience yeah, that's going to be a surprise and or something they release later on in the trailer. So okay. I think sometimes we forget that like my mom and dad have not seen that Wolverine costume or like, you know, you know, it, it's one of those weird things. Like we think it's out there already, but it's really not. You know what I mean? Sure. So that's probably why they didn't show it. And it's also I'm one ready. of their big reveals. So sure. we'll see. Can I, can I say one thing about the Super Bowl trailers? Sure. Uh, I was at a uh, Super Bowl well, party. Kevin didn't with, answer. With, oh, <laughs> Kevin yeah. Didn't yeah, Kevin didn't answer. <laughs> oh, I, I think the best trailer was probably the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Okay. In terms that of trailers. Like, that Jake, was awesome. What happened with your reaction? Did you get a reaction? Well, I, was at, I was at a uh, Super Bowl party with, with my girlfriend and her family, and, and there was a good amount of people there. And, you know, of all the, you know, at, at that point, you know, when you have that many people there, you know, you're watching the game, but, you know, everyone's talking, and, and sometimes people will react to a commercial. Sometimes, you know, you can't really hear stuff. The movie trailer that made the party stop and look at the TV and go, wait, what's that? Was Wicked. Really? Yeah, that was the trailer. I had the, same, that, I had the same thing. That was yeah, the yeah. trailer that most people around me paused and go, wait, there's, wait, they're, they're doing a Wicked movie? Yeah, like, yeah I was going to say, was, that's the project no one knew was happening, I yeah, guess. So yeah, so I, I, I would, yeah, I would that argue that. To, that speaks to what I'm saying about that. That's exactly right, 100%. Like, I think of all the, yeah. uh, you know, the, the you know, in terms of like the, the sledgehammer of an impact that a movie trailer hopes to make, I think I would give Wicked the award, at least amongst the, the people that I was surrounded by. And it's funny, like going back to the point I made about the Wolverine shot and how we've already seen the Wolverine costume with, with Wicked. And for example, I remember I had, I had like a bunch of people over at my place for the Super Bowl 
And people's genuine general reaction to the Wicked trailer was, oh, Ariana Grande's in this? That's, that's yeah. what? She's yeah. in this? And I'm like, I feel like I've known that for yeah. like a year. And, the, and honestly, that's one of the weirdest things that we have to deal with, uh, that we deal with in our industry is that we're so in a bubble. We are so attached to what we do for a living. Uh, you guys run a movie website. Sure. It's one of those things that we just need to stop and go, this is not common knowledge. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, yeah. Michelle's reaction was to mine, which is Twisters. Like, I'm all in on Twisters. Twisters. Yeah, me too. I'm all in. And Michelle looked at me at that yeah. one. And she goes, they're doing Twisters. Yes. Oh, yes. That's, uh, yeah, why, dude, why did yeah. I just picture uh, uh, James Cameron writing Twisters on, on the board right, twi and then writing the S with a dollar sign through it? Like, I just pictured well, him doing that. One yeah. of my favorite things online, because the, uh, the Twisters trailer is fantastic, by it the way. Great. I also think Glenn Powell is awesome. That dude's about to be one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I don't know if y'all seen the box office numbers for for anyone but you. Yeah, that it's been fantastic. Is crushing for an R-rated uh, uh, romantic comedy. But it, did you guys see someone someone did a, a, a Twister's uh, joke poster. It was Twister Twister and it was like sister sister and it was the two uh, the sisters from the show. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so great. That's really the, funny. Uh, remember, remember sister sister? Of course. Yeah, 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 but the yeah. Twister's poster only has one tornado on it. Wait, like, is it true? Really? Yes, it, it says Twisters and it well, has Sean, one that's giant the plot tornado twist. on it. That's the spoiler plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's revealed. one tornado behind <laughs> the other tornado. Yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite reaction with the group is because that came on and people were just like, similar to the Wicked, they were like, wait, is this Twister? Is this Twister? And then they saw the like the Dorothy went up and someone yeah. went, Dorothy! The Dorothy. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Which wow. they also Does said during the Wicked trailer. Wait, doesn't it look exactly like the stuff, the tech from oh, the first movie? That's, the, the movie looks yeah. like Twister. It looks like yeah. the poster exactly. looks the same. Like they really nailed it. Yeah, it do looks guys, like Twister. Do you guys think there's two questions I want to ask? Because one of my favorite things about Twister was Philip Seymour Hoffman. That's like one of, of my favorite performances that he's mm -hmm. done in his career. But someone tweeted this. So I can't take credit for it. But someone was asking, do you think that we'll get a cow scene again? And I feel like they have to do that because for people who haven't seen the original Twister, it's one of the most famous know. scenes from Twister when the cow goes up. I was the trailer a button. It was the trailer yeah. button too. Yeah. yeah, and I I think they're good. there has to be a nod. I bet you there's going to be like a moment where like... Well, I mean, given how close it looks and even that trailer looks, I assume it's going to be full of nods. It feels like that kind of, that yes. kind of movie. That's also the drive-in scene. The drive-in scene is a legit scary scene. Yeah, I get terrified. Are they, are they well watching done. The Shining? No. I think so. Uh, are they? That's I think they're, they're watching, watching The Shining. And I think it's I the bathroom. Remember. I think it's the mm -hmm. Here's Johnny scene. Oh, that sounds right. And, yeah, and this is a standalone right. sequel, right? It's not a. It's, it's not a continuation. It's, it's apparently not con connected at all to the really? original. It's more well, just it's not, like it's, it's not, not. It's not Jaws four. It's not going to be the same Twister from nineteen ninety six. That <laughs> like, oh, it has returned. Jake, you haven't seen the movie. You don't know that. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> not like Glenn Powell is like Helen Hunt's son or anything like that. I don't. I don't. I don't think. I think it's just a reimagining of the and concept. also too you know unfortunately we've lost so many cast members from from that original cast that i yeah. feel like yeah. it would be it paxton would be too hard to yeah we lost paxton and we lost hoffman and yeah. and uh, and i believe I, I, i'm sorry i forget her name the the uh, amazing actress who played like the grandmother in the film i think we lost her um what so, if the movie is oh. just tom cruise comes in to take out the twister with a with a missile from his from his fighter jet i'm <laughs> in a, I'm, the I'm in. <laughs> there's a billion dollars <laughs> the difference this time is that Andy Serkis is actually playing the tornado through performance capture. And then they, and he, and they, and he, they show us the behind the scenes footage and it's just him on set going, mm, and, then, and then going, I don't know. Like, mm. Smeagol, Smeagol versus Gollum. And they're just fighting each other. <laughs> Gus, yes, Gus yes, yes, Gabe, that is the motion yeah, that a twister the, makes. The, the twister. You're right. Gus, Gus Van Sant says, damn it, Andy, I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this show started, for God's sake. Oh my God, we haven't even done housekeeping. If you're watching us on YouTube, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but hit subscribe and, and uh, turn on your notifications anyway. We're at youtube.com backslash Roblin Podcast. Of course, available all the different places you get your audio needs met. And we have a newsletter that you can get through Real Blend Premium. In addition, if you sign up for Real Blend Premium, you get an ad-free version of the show, which is reason enough that you're going to want to sign up and and hang out with us on a regular basis. Uh, look, we got a really busy week, like I talked about. Um, Bob Marley, One Love, is opening uh, or is in theaters now. As you're listening to this, it opened on Wednesday in time for Valentine's Day. We have interviews with uh, Kingsley Benadir on last Friday's show. And then we also have uh, the director, Ronaldo Marcus Green, 
uh, that was a standalone episode that dropped on Wednesday. So after you see Bob Marley or even before, it's not like we got into massive spoilers or anything. Uh, go check out those two interviews on behalf of that film. This week, however, in honor of Madam Webb dropping, Sony was nice enough to give us time with director S.J. Clarkson, who has uh, some terrific fi- uh, television credits to her name. She did Jessica Jones. Uh, Jake talks to her about the Game of Thrones pilot episode that she directed that sadly did not get picked up or uh, expanded on. She touched on that for a little bit. And then, of course, we dive into all things Madam Web, which we will review on the other side of the interview. So without further ado, this is S.J. Clarkson joining us on the Roblin podcast. Off we go. Hi, S.J. How are you doing? Hi, Sean. Nice to meet you. Love your T-shirt. Thank you very much. I'm the I'm the hopeless Spider-Man fan. Uh, He's sucking group. up. I was going to say, did you wear that especially for me today? Yes. No, these are, I have way too many Spider-Man t-shirts, as Jake will attest. I love it. I am- well, fine. I'm going to go change my shirt, too. Please, please do, Jake. I feel like you've not made the effort. I know. I got to step it up. <laughs> so we are uh, part of the Real Blend podcast. We're down one host who has to be on the air right now. Uh, we're a filmmaker-driven podcast, and we like to get into the the nuts and bolts and the the nitty gritty of filmmaking. Um, and I want to start here uh, because Cassie's power, mm-hmm. her visions, um, I would assume are a lot of fun to write on paper, but a nightmare to plan for, uh, to visually present in terms of like the amount of extra footage you have to shoot or how to plan out your edit. And I was wondering if you could just sort of elaborate your approach to those visions, because if you go in one direction, you potentially lose the audience and, um, but also you don't want to go overboard with them, you know, and make them too Baroque, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Of course. We yes. encourage it, actually. Oh, OK, good. Then I then I found my people. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> when I first got the script, I genuinely was like clairvoyance. What the fuck am I going to do with this? Right. Because it's, just like, <laughs> it's not a physical visual action thing. So you're immediately thinking, what the fuck? Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, but then I just sort of sat down kind of, you know, as you do, go, I better take this seriously and think about it. And and I guess it just led me to think that this was an amazing cinematic opportunity, that mm. if we approach this movie as if it was, say, more like a psychological thriller, maybe borderline mm. horror moments at times, some of those quick edits, sound, you know, the visions. And it's like you say, right, Sean, it's like if you give too much of the vision away, it's a yawn fest, right? Because then everybody knows what's coming. So it's about mm-hmm. how do we keep that fresh and interesting? And how does the psychic powers work? How how do you see clairvoyance? I've never had clairvoyance. Uh, if I had, I might have made different choices along the way in my life. But like, you know, so I was like, how can we do that? But I do have memories and I do think about things. And sometimes sort of a memory will come racing back to you, right? And But it doesn't necessarily come at you in a linear way. It's often mm-hmm. non slipstream of sound and images and it will be like oh i remember being at this party and wearing a red dress not that i've ever been to a party in a red dress but you know and you'll see the red and then you'll see rain you're like why was it raining oh yeah i remember i got out of the car and i tried in a puddle and and it's all these images that sort of come at you almost a cacophony you know you know with the sound and these sort of images and then with the click cuts and the visceral nature of what she's seeing it was like how can i make this the most arresting um and visual and exciting and and an action mm. sequence with really her just sitting there seeing things. So that was kind of the challenge. And then obviously yeah. in the planning of it, it was like a lot of homework and a lot more than I thought because you happen to shoot each scene two, three, sometimes even four times with a different mm-hmm. outcome and a different setup. And every setup takes so long and you're like, oh my God, we didn't have three times the amount of time to shoot it. So how we, so it really was about prepping, especially on something like the train sequence. I've never had more, notes on my sides in my life do you know what i mean i mean literally every sort of the back of the pages there was little storyboards and like the jackets on the jackets off get this reaction the heads turns to the left the right the trains coming in from behind which of course blue screen so the train interactive lightings are on now they're off and so i'm calling all these things out like a crazy lady you know (laughs) and and you know really hoping that it was going to work out you know when you're like yeah 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 we got this it's going to be amazing just thinking please and oh my you hire gosh. an amazing editor you hire an amazing editor like lee folsom boyd who i was privileged enough to get who's been in this world for, for a couple of the other big movies and you know she kind of got behind what i was doing and the technique that i was using which was this sort of diopter which is all by hand none of its visual effects which was me sort of with a diopter swiping it in front of the lens and using sometimes a flashlight to give it a sort of a blinded approach and then literally meticulously 
we call it frame fucking. So you take it and you sort of cut out frames, add takes from other sections of the scene that you've shot, then cut back to some frames of the diopter, and then you come to a different part of the scene and then back to it. And you use this sort of cutting technique and editorial technique in order to kind of like flash into the future. And what the diopter yeah. did in its very nature is it sort of warps the sense of depth of field, right? And and sort of like like blurriness and and focal lengths and so it screws everything up to makes it feel really weird and 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 kind of like disorientating yeah you know when you fuck that you you kind of so it's frame fucking on frame fucking basically that's the technical term anyway that i'm using well that's i hope you really trademark cool. yeah <laughs> frame fucking please yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. one of my favorite quotes that I think has ever been said on the show in my entire <laughs> life. I gotta say just really quick that's with that story, thinking about the train sequence, I got anxiety thinking about your, I don't know if this is the correct term, but like you, uh, the person in charge of uh, continuity, like the continuity um, supervisor, like just the yeah, idea yeah. of whoever d- just well done to that person. Um, well, that's Dawn Still. She is like an icon of script supervising. She's just uh, a pro. I'm not going to say she's vintage because I got called that earlier because I made something in 2003 and I remembered it. So like, I'm not going to call her vintage, but she's been around and she is awesome. And she was like my my sort of like right hand on set because it's it's so difficult. I'm like, did, did we get that reaction? Did we get DJ looking horrified? Did we get her looking bewildered? Did we get, you know? So, yeah. So so kudos to, to your script supervisor. And in my case, it was Dawn, who is an absolute legend. Well done. Um, obviously, this is a story that takes place, you know, as as a lot of comic book movies do these days in a bigger universe. And I'm sort of curious as a storyteller, how much you feel like you need to know at the beginning when you sit down and you're deciding whether or not to take on this film. Do you have the right to be able to go to them and say, listen, I need to know who my mom, who my Spider-Man is. I need to know, it, it, are we heading toward a world where we're going to collide or are we heading toward, you know, X, Y or Z? Like how many of those future answers do you need? to or have a right to know from the beginning, even though they might not be relevant at this very moment? I mean, I ask a lot of questions, you know, but the one thing that I think was a gift of this film was the fact that it was a standalone universe. You know, it's an origin Mm -hmm. story of a character that we know, but she's on the periphery. And some know, the great fans know, you know, but, you know, you walk in the street and you can ask who Spider-Man is and everyone's going to know. You walk in the street and you ask 10 people who Madam Web is, most of them until now wouldn't have known, you know. So that gives you a little bit of freedom. It liberates you in many ways. It's a no homework required movie where we, you don't have to have watched loads of other movies to understand who she is. We sort of uncover and explore that as we go along long right you know and the questions are really for me always come from a a point of character how what is the journey that she's going to go on what's the story that we're trying to tell how are these characters going to be connected within this world you know so those are the big questions that I start to ask and then you know then I can bring in how am I going to bring this to life cinematically SJ I want to ask was there a romantic relationship between uh Ben and Cassie or is is that something I just picked up on Ah, no, interesting. Do you know what? It's a completely platonic relationship, but I always allow my actors to have a secret. So, like, I don't know if they're secret as they did shag in the past. I don't know. <laughs> one, one night could have happened. Not in our not in our backstories, but no. What I loved about their relationship, it was a, sort of this sort of platonic, you know, boy-girl friendship, which, you know, is sometimes rare in these movies or any movie sometimes, right? You know, it's tend to be the girls and the boys. And, and you know, and I have some male friends that I'm really close to. And and I like the idea, you know, I like what you can sometimes talk to the boys about and, and, it, and it feels different. And I thought that was really great for her. And it sort of was right for her character that that he was like her best mate in a way. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. Sean and I both had it. There's one moment in the film where to sort of talk around it, he says that he's met someone and she sort of goes like, oh, and then there's like almost a beat and she goes, oh, and Sean and I both interpreted that as like, oh, they had something going on. And and that, so that's interesting how, you know, that's a beautiful thing about film. Read it and the girls, I didn't read it like that, but like, I, just, I think it's more like, I don't know. I mean, she's like, I think because she says, what's this one's name? Mm. We get the impression that Ben, you know, might have a few women that he meets from time to time. You know, but I think did you Adam ever himself? Were you ever going to include May? Because we're all the all the fans were kind of like hanging. Like, are we going to get to see May? Was she ever part of the mix? Not of them. No, not in this film. No. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, you have such a great history working in television, in which case you have to uh, sort of jump into the middle of a story already in progress, sort of keep that vibe going and then sort of allow it to sort of still be there for the next person to sort of jump in. Um, this is obviously a standalone film, a standalone story, but also hopefully down the road, a 
piece of what is going to be a bigger picture as well. So I'm sort of curious if there were any skills that you brought over from your your expertise in television that were applicable here, or is it apples and oranges? Oh, no, listen, without doubt, I think everything I've done led me to this moment, you know, because TV can be really fast paced. And, you know, I've predominantly done pilots for the last few years, which has been a real joy, you know, to sort of take on new shows and set up new worlds. And yes, that's exactly my job. You set up the world and you leave it open ended so that it can go on, you know, and I guess there's probably some of that in this, you know, you want to, I'd love to feel this could go on, you know, right now. Um, And I guess everything in TV, like, you know, I've been in the Marvel universe before with television, which was just such, it was actually my first sort of introduction to the Marvel world. I'll be honest. I hadn't really really read comics and stuff before then. And I remember being sent alias and just, oh my God, I sat down and I thought, I'll flick through this and see what it's like. I read it from cover to cover. I thought it was the most extraordinary piece of storytelling, you know, the brevity and the narration and the dialogue and the, and the framing, the cinematic framing, you know, I, I sort of, I couldn't believe how kind of amazing it looks and, and this newfound sort of respect for that genre. I just, I was kind of bitten and, and I've definitely used the comics and look at some of those frames, you know, that really burst out of the frame, right? You know, in the comics themselves, you just go, you feel like they're grabbing you, you know, and so using that. So Jessica was definitely a wonderful foundation for this. You know, I felt like I'd at least spent some time in this world and understood it a bit, not anywhere near as much as you guys and, and you know, the the, the, the amazing fans, because they are the most amazing fans and, and brilliant, you know, because they're so deep into it. You know, so you always want to, I always wanted to make sure I brought something and, you know, it's some Easter eggs from the comics and tried to sort of pepper in as much as I could, you know, so there's some stuff to seek out, you know. But yeah, TV's definitely been a massive influence, you know. It's been a lot of hours of telly to get to this moment, right? <laughs> um, SJ, how, I'm curious how much the script changed um, from the first time that you got it, you know, all the way through the final cut. Were, were there a lot of alterations throughout as you were going or was it something where when it came to you, it was it was fairly complete? It did. It could get, went through some changes. I mean, and, and and even editorially, you know, we went through changes. Things moved around mm-hmm. a little bit. Structurally, it pretty much remained the same. I think the character development was something that, you know, I was very keen to sort of explore a bit more. And definitely mm-hmm. the clairvoyance, the way that the clairvoyance played out, I think, weirdly what you talked about earlier was in the script it was sometimes a bit confusing it was like well what is actually happening here and I think as the director and seeing it it was easier for me to sort of like wrestle with that on the page so that it was more Mm. sort of comprehensive in terms of what we were going to be doing but yeah it's like I think everything now it's very rare that you take even in tv that you take a script and it sort of is exactly as is there's invariably a couple of scenes that get lost because you don't need them because you've already explained it you know Mm. and there's ways in which the character you're like they get it you know i think i think for us there there may be there was probably some of the clairvoyant scenes i was so nervous the audience wouldn't get it that i might have over over explained it and as we went Mm. through the process we realized oh they get it they're they're actually just smart audience they got it so i was able to sort of like you know pull back on that but yeah it's 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 always a fluid thing and, and i think i've experienced that more than anything on this big movie you know from because i've been on it two and a half years so definitely from the very beginning to now i think i think we only finished the movie last friday i mean terrifying it's been a white knuckle ride i know so what i I know last friday yeah because we had visual effects still coming in and everything by the time it was all put together so i watched the final dcp on, on friday a week ago today Oh my gosh. Wow. What a relief. What a relief. You must feel so relieved. <laughs> I am. Like I can't have a glass of wine right now. I'll be so drunk because I'm just be like, you know, when it's been 18 hour days uh, for the whole of January to get it here. And like, you know, I didn't want to miss a beat. I wanted to just give everything at it and do the best I could and, and yeah. deliver it and, uh, you know, to the best that I could in the time that we had. So yeah, but it was, a, it was a sprint to the finish. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You've earned a I bottle will. of wine, glass Thank of you. wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to circle back around to something you touched on, which is that you have worked uh, in with Marvel before, but Marvel is always constantly changing. And God knows it has changed a lot um, mm-hmm. since you, you worked on there. Just so many just things that they've introduced and concepts and stuff. So how much uh, did you sort of kind of whenever you sort of realize, OK, I'm getting back into this. Was there a degree of like, wait, what the hell is going on with Marvel now? Like, or did you follow it all along or was there a little bit of catch up that needed to be played? I guess I look, I take on every film or story as it is as a new piece, right? And I think that was the gift of Jessica. Yeah, uh, sorry, of, of Madame Webb. She was new and much like Jessica, it was its own new thing. And she's a character on the periphery and it was a standalone. So in many ways, it was, you know, it was 
it was easier that I didn't have to do too much homework. But obviously, I'm across. I go see the movies. You know, I love seeing them. There's been some great films, I think, out over the last few years. You know, Black Panther, extraordinary. You know, so, some and and Doctor Strange. You know, there's some there's ones that are very close to my heart. You know, that I love. But you know, this this being a standalone probably just gave me a little bit of freedom to kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, not have to get a bit bogged down in the homework of everything else and try and deliver something new and fresh. I think everything, you know, there's always, it has to evolve, right? It can't stay the same. Technology moves on, we move on. We've moved on since the pandemic, you know, things do change. So I think it's uh, it's inevitable that things will evolve. Ashley, I want to get your take on um, movie marketing nowadays, which can be so reliant on viral moments you know uh, and whether it be something that comes from a trailer or sydney sweeney who you work with doing hot ones uh, I, she was brilliant how much of well, that she did so well uh, so impressed i'd have been rubbing she, the first one she, <laughs> she, <laughs> would have popped out on the first one i was like there's no way i could have done the hot sauce thing i'm such a wimp she says isabella needs to do it next but isabella says that she snots up whenever she takes anything. Yeah, but they, no, Isabella <laughs> could around. literally wipe the floor with everybody on it. I think. May, she, if, I don't know about her snotting up. That's her words, not mine. But like you know, she yeah, can yeah. floor with everybody on that. Yeah, yeah. How much though do those moments? Do you think help the film versus distract from from the work that's being done? Oh, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I think the way we all consume. You know, entertainment and information now is so vast, isn't it? I mean, look at podcasts, which I love. You know, I'm such Mm. a big fan of them. I listen to them a lot, um, which I never did before. And I learn a lot of things from podcasts. So isn't it great that we have those now? And obviously for a new audience. I'll I'll recommend one, uh, Real Blend. You should give it a try. Yeah, is it any good? (laughs) What are the presenters? Add it to your your list. (laughs) One of the guys, all he wears is Spider-Man shirts. It's kind of annoying. I'm totally it. I'm totally (laughs) it. But, but you know, but I, I think it's a way, look, you want to get people to see the movie. That's what I want. I want you know, and you and I can talk about the film till I'm blue in the face, but it doesn't. That's never going to be the same as you sitting in the theater and, and experiencing it. You know, and that's why I made it. I made it for it to be experienced on the big screen with a collective group of people. You know, to go on that ride together, and yeah. you know. So I think it's it's you know the wonderful thing now is there are so many avenues to sort of find out about things so there is that you know tiktok and instagram and you know and i'm kind of a bit far removed from that because i am vintage as i've discovered um <laughs> you know, so you know i i think i think it can be really helpful i mean what you hope is it just allows people access to it and that's hopefully you know we'll get more people to see it and then the film one hopes will speak for itself right yeah yes exactly I really want to know who called you vintage like that. That made an impact. Listen, it was actually one of the marketing people. They were just like, they, they, I think it's because they were they were actually applying it for themselves. And I said, well, if you are, that's me too. No, I think, listen, I'm, vintage is good. I, 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 I love the 70s, right? You know, we opened the movie in the 70s. Mm, that's or, right. Yes. I love the 70s, 70s music. I mean, like, I'm just like Elton John, Bowie. They're all on my Spotify, you know. Sure you know for the nice relaxing Sundays you know so I've got the I've got the the, the, the you know my 70s music and uh you know T-Rex as well wait but so. wait I want to ask about 2003 music because it's very important to this film I, I probably didn't expect as much Britney as I got for this film come on, can you ever have too much Britney <laughs> You can never have no, too much Britney. Come on. It's true. Me. It's true. T- tell me about your choices, about what songs you fought for to make sure that they were part of this movie. You know, I can't take credit for Britney because that was in the script that I got sent. So like, I could sit here and just like go, oh, that was me. No, that was in the original script. And it was one of the things I love most about it. I thought this is kind of cool to use this. Yeah. And it's a, I think it's a real fun moment in the movie. And and it reminded me of a time. It's a bit like when, you know, for my generation, Dancing Queen comes on or something. You know, it's one of those songs that you just smile and you just know and everybody loves. You know, Britney, the toxic has that. And it's been amazing. Yeah. Even before the film was starting to get out or sort of the versions of the film or people talking about it, I started to hear Britney playing more. And I was like, okay, this is kind of fun, you know. And obviously we got the Beyonce poster in the movie. You know, that I remember, such an iconic album of the time, you know. And mm-hmm. Awesome is she to let's use that in the movie. I'm so chuffed that it's in the film, and because it was such crazy in love, was just we listened to it all the time, you know. Yeah. So and Mystique, you know, it really is. It really is fun, you know. And then the end with the cranberries, you know. Perfect. So, yes, perfect. that was such a great. That was such a great song to end on. And and, and honestly, <laughs> props to Sony. A lot of times we're very spoiled. You mentioned the the pandemic, post pandemic. 
nine times out of ten we would love to get a link just to be able to watch at home and sony insisted that we see this on the big screen so props to mm -hmm. them for really pushing for the theatrical experience yeah and i'm really excited yeah. they did that and thank you for going because it is easy yeah, of course to of course like, to see it in that experience in the cinema is you know that's what makes it exciting right Absolutely. Um, because you have such an incredible filmography, I would love to sort of bounce around and ask a couple of just nerdy things. Okay. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the series Succession. And okay. I know you got to sort of jump in there. Really, one of the first episodes, I believe, episode eight of the first season. Um, seven, right. seven, seven. Yeah, uh, Prague, right? Prague. Yes. Uh, I'm just sort of curious uh, what your thoughts were on mm -hmm. the finale, how you feel about how like who ended up being, you know, the successor. Don't spoil it. I haven't watched it yet. Oh, you haven't watched no. it. How far <laughs> behind are you? I'm so glad I didn't say anything then. Please don't say anything. Because I would never. I've been so crazy on this. I haven't caught the last season yet. So, and I've really managed to not find out anything. Wouldn't that be so great if, if it got I'm spoiled? Like, I don't know. So please don't tell me. I've really managed to, I've really managed to not. <laughs> that would have like seriously crushed my soul if I'd been the person who ruined Succession for one of the directors of Succession. That would be so upsetting. No, please let me have the privilege of that. Yes. I'm, honestly, I'm dying to know what you think. I personally, okay, as a fan well, of the I'll show, I loved it. it. Yes. Because he's a genius. So I know whatever happens, I'm going to love it because he's such a talented, uh, probably one of the best out there on the planet right now. And just such an extraordinary bloke as well. So yeah, I'm so chuffed for their success. Oh, die hey, to know. Sony PR. It, though. Stop right now. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure they warn every show you're about to go on. <laughs> Not to bring it oh up. Oh my god, to not you. to bring it up and tell me. And my publicist is literally here wigging now. They're gonna make sure it doesn't get spoiled. Could you imagine? Yeah, I'm, I'm so behind. But I've honestly just literally, as I said, we finished this on Friday. So I have just like not seen anything. I, I mean that's a good excuse to not have seen it. Do you know what I mean? It's better than me going, I didn't finish the film, but I've watched Succession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what happened with that at least. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So I want to talk a bit about um, your cast as well, too, and what Dakota brings um, as a leading lady. But you have such strong personalities, even in the trio of girls that she's shepherding over. And Isabella in particular, I want to sort of get into because she's got a tremendous experience playing with um, familiar franchises, popular characters. Um, and, and she gave me some really good insight into respecting the source material, but making sure that you have the freedom to do your own thing with it. Um, can you talk about your take on that um, and, and then giving each of those girls time to shine as they figured out what their personalities were going to be in this film. Look, the great thing when you do a movie like this is you have this sort of like, you know, Bible of knowledge, right? Uh, uh, of yeah. stuff. They do change. If you actually read them all, they're quite different depending on who wrote them, you know, depending yeah. on the series they're in. You know, if you look at Madame Webb herself from the 1980s original comics to, you know, the latter versions, you know, when she became super sexy and very different. So it's just like, so where are we finding our version? And I think, I think it's like, you know, you're looking for the spirit of the character, you know, when you look at who they are and what they're going to become, because, you know, you're casting with it in mind to hopefully that if they go on, that they've got a life ahead of them. And it is mm -hmm. about giving the basis of, of the comics and the characters, finding the spirit in the actor, and then giving them the space to play, really, you know, and that's what mm -hmm. you have. Otherwise, if people feel straight jacketed, then I think it's very hard to find a truthful, nuanced performance, right? Because they'll feel mm -hmm. trapped in it. But you always want to honor the original source material. You know, you can't, I didn't personally didn't want to deviate too far from that, but to give them the freedom with which to play, you know, and to find themselves. And I think in terms of the three spiders, we were, I was really keen that they felt different. You know, there were questions like, why three? You don't need all three. And I was like, no, I think we do because they each bring something different. And in many ways, each of the girls for me represented the past, the present and the future, which is the journey that it goes on. Do you know what I mean? So Matt is completely in the moment. She's instinctual. You know, she's sort of like, you know, Fisty cuff, get away out of anything. You know, Julia is more thinking back to the past and like my life used to be like this. And if we did, but we did this last time. So if we do it like this and Anya has this sort of, you know, ability to sort of look more forward thinking as it were as a character. So it was really important to me that they each represented sort of the facets of Cassie's journey, which is she's in the present and probably not really living the most fulfilled life. And she has to go back and discover something about her past in order to make better choices for the future. And that to okay. me, I wanted to overload the movie with profundity. I thought was what made it 
relevant to today and what made it quite interesting. And so mm-hmm. each of the girls for me represented that, this past, present and future in a subtle way. You didn't want it to be like laid over the head with a trowel, but within the scenes, the way they each dealt with everything, it's sort of like, no, we should, you just like, no, we should do this. Matt is like, we should do this. And then, you know, Anya will be like, well, if we did this, this would happen. So, you know, if you look about then that really helped with the way that their characters and their voices came, you know, and that's something we developed during the process with, you know, my writing partner, Claire and I, we really took that and really thought about that, of how they could then each service the plot by being their characters and bringing that forward. Wow. Um, Astrid, I have a, a strange fascination with uh, things that did not end up happening. Uh, I love Jodorowsky's Dune and, you know, people that whole documentary was great. And I also have uh, a dog named Daenerys. That's, that's not her. That's Kai. Um, but she's around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> and so I would love to ask you about uh, your Game of Thrones pilot. And I'm just sort of curious, you know, there are a lot of sort of ideas about what it was going to be. And I felt like there's a time where HBO was announcing a new Game of Thrones spinoff every 15 minutes. I was just I would love to hear from your perspective uh, what it was going to be and what you remember shooting that. Oh, gosh, that was a while ago now. But yeah, look. Uh, it's an amazing series, right? It's brilliant and it's iconic. And I think there's so many opportunities for many spin-offs of that show, which is why I think it was a bit like a bake-off at the time. There was an awful lot of series going out, scripts and pilots being made. You know, I loved it. I had a wonderful cast. Uh, I thought it was terrific. And I guess the rest you have to ask HBO about. Yeah. I'd love to see it. Me too. <laughs> it's not unlike Star Wars where they just announce projects and, you know, throw throw them out there and right, and then right, you left right, to right. wonder about all right well we will get you out of here on this one um i want to bring it back around to a very specific scene um in your film that uh makes use of i believe practical effects to dakota tried to explain to it a little bit it's it's the shot of the ambulance crashing oh yeah um, and and it's it's done in a one shot that comes around over her shoulder to show the crash happening behind her um, it seems like you made that extra complicated on yourself <laughs> for the timing and the execution of that and not giving yourself enough to like having to do it multiple times would be expensive, I would assume. No, I had one shot at it. They they didn't want me to do it like that. So I had one go at it and and it and it was a risk. It was a risk. I do remember it was a bit of a risk. Um and I think the reason I did it, and I'm so thrilled you picked up on it. I love this. You're now my favourites because it, it, it's a big moment. And it was a big moment for me in the movie because up until then, all the clairvoyant moments have been really frenetic, right? Everything had been fast cut, the diopters, jump cuts. And I wanted this moment to be real, super mm. real. There's no cut in a way. There was no, I didn't want to build up the tension editorially. I wanted the tension to just be there. So mm. I did make it hard for myself, but... DJ is such a great actor. I knew I could rely on her. And I had Dave Emmerich's uh, camera operator, steady cam operator. And uh, we use the ZG, which is kind of like between handheld and steady cam. And I knew he could do, I knew. I just, I was in such safe hands with him. He's such an incredible operator. And I had Mauro who got behind it. And, you know, and I had a brilliant special effects team headed by Jeremy Hayes. And again, it was this collaboration of working with everybody and everybody got excited about it because you don't really do stunts in one as, right? It's a big risk. Sure. So we, rehearsed, we rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed a lot. And, you know, it's obviously, is this, do you go out before the movie goes out or after? Uh, after, we're coming out on oh, the 16th. Good. So spoiler. But it's in the trailer, regardless. Yeah, yeah. It's in the trailer. But spoiler is, so, so, the, so the actual garbage truck sort of like, does it, does all the work, right? But it was mm-hmm. about how can I flip out? You know, I actually wanted him, it was supposed to be all in one shot. So I wanted him to get in and then I was going to Hollywood him out the other side. But that got a bit complicated and it also felt too slow. It felt like when I when I looked at the rehearsal of that, it felt like I was, you were expecting something to happen because I didn't cut. And it felt like it was an, it was sort of like, it was self-consciously not cutting rather than it just being been just part of the cutting process so yeah for me it was like how do we do that so rehearse 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 and then you know we did it and thank god it sort of worked on the day you know but yeah Uh. it's one of those moments where i felt for the audience i wanted them to feel like in these frenetic moments of clairvoyance it was terrifying but then when the real thing happened it was just all on her we're with her it happens in the background and then i literally come around her and then let her take us back to it to realize It's the biggest moment in the movie where she realizes had she acted upon what she was seeing with more sort of conviction, she right. act- could have saved a life, you know? Right. And that to me felt like a really important moment. And that to me was the only way to cinematically tell that story. Oh, I love it. That's exactly what I wanted. That's, to that's her like great power comes great responsibility <laughs> moment. That's her, that's sort of that watershed moment in a way. 
It's the way where she sees it. It's the way where she's faced with, I didn't make the choice. And therefore, next time it happens, what is she going to do? And then the next time it is on the train. And therefore, she then has no choice in the way. Right? Yep. Absolutely. I'm so glad you noticed that bit. Oh, that's what we do. That's the whole point of this show is to pick out moments like that and and get into the science as to why they make us feel the way that they do. So thank you, SJ, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it and continued success. Hopefully we'll get you back on sometime soon. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. you. And and next time, Jake, the spider t-shirt, right? Yes, absolutely. Spider t-shirt and next time, succession finale. Okay, you got it. That's a trade. Okay, thanks so much. Nice to meet you all. We want to thank our good friends at Sony for hooking us up with uh, SJ Clarkson and of course SJ Clarkson for coming on the show. Uh, Jakey, this is, you know, we want to mention that that there's a big difference between interviewing somebody uh, for a movie and then reviewing their film. And it's something that we take a lot of pride in on the show. Yeah, very much so. And look, uh, you know, if you couldn't tell from from that conversation, uh, we really liked SJ. Like, she's Mm -hmm. a really cool lady and I would say is welcome back on the show anytime. I very much loved hearing what she had to say. I very much dug her vibe. I loved her energy. She seemed really cool. Uh, I thought it was a very fun and respectful conversation. Um, I I can't speak on on how Sean and Kevin are going to review the movie, um, but I am, as we get into the review portion, of Madam Web going to review the film very negatively. Uh, I very much do not like Madam Web. And, you know, I feel like sometimes there is um, a confusion between being kind to someone and showing respect to someone in an interview and disliking their films. And and one is not necessarily reflective of the other. You know, I do think uh, that we have as professionals uh, the obligation and the ability to separate our personal feelings about a film and our ability to have a civil adult, respectful, interesting conversation with some of the people behind them. You know, movie making is a miracle. And it, 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 any, any movie that, that finds its way to the big screen is by definition a miracle that it was able to happen. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a quality you know film, but every film has some aspect that is worthy of conversation. Some of the best interviews I, I've ever had and I think the show has ever had have been for movies that we did not like. And I have had plenty of not that great interviews for movies that I really cared about and loved. One does not is not reflective of the other. So I just really wanted to take a moment before you know the uh, gasoline was poured over the comment section and a, and a uh, match was struck to just remind people that that it is entirely possible to be respectful to someone and have a genuine mm-hmm. kind honest conversation yeah. and also admit i didn't like the movie that they made mm-hmm. yeah in fact one of the like the final question that we talk about uh with the ambulance shot is a legitimately great shot it is a cool in shot. the movie. It and is a cool shot. I'm really glad that I got a chance to ask her about that because you hear those behind the scenes uh, happenings of how quickly things have to move on a film set and how you can map out different things and choreograph certain things. And I find all of that stuff to be really sure. interesting. We're still sure. getting a chance to sit down with a director, you know, on a major motion picture working for one of the main studios. Of course, we're going to have plenty of stuff to talk to her about. Now, sure. unfortunately, as we transition into our review portion of the film, and, and I th- we'll keep this spoiler free. I mean, with the, there's still you know plenty of opportunity for you to to go see Madam Web. In in a way, I, I strangely encourage you to go see Madam Web. It's it's one of these movies that a little bit has to be seen to be believed because I just don't think. Um, and I'm being as brutally honest as I can. I don't think it works on any level. Uh, and I listen. I'm I'm the diehard you know Spider Man guy in this in this room. Um, I don't understand these movies. I just don't get them. I don't understand this concept of making standalone movies for Spider-Man's villains that don't involve Spider-Man in any way, shape or form. And now this movie does involve Spider-Man in ways that I still can't quite believe. And I will leave it at that uh, alone in case you want to discover it. But this is like and, and you hear this joke level that these these films often movies that that turn out like this like it's like it's like back to 2003 when there was no real um which i think is when this film is set it's the year the movie takes place it is set in that but so around that time you got movies like ghost rider uh and ben affleck's daredevil electra um movies that were made by people who weren't paying that much attention to the source material who didn't necessarily care about um honoring the characters or the legacy. And then Marvel came around and sort of changed all of that by at least 
paying attention to the characters and their traits and, and building things through Iron Man and Captain America and Thor and building its own cinematic universe. But even through them, you saw other uh, movies take comic books more seriously. It led to things like Kick-Ass, um, DC building things through Man of Steel, Batman versus Superman. It, the comic book genre changed. This is a return back to um, we're just going to make a comic book movie that has a recognizable uh, character name across the top of it. And yet they're still choosing like a third tier Spider-Man character. Madam Web by no means is a prime Spider-Man character or villain even. Um, and so if Sony's going to continue to make these villain movies, I don't know why they don't do a Dr. Octopus film or why they don't make a standalone Green Goblin movie. Like make something that people care about because there's no story in this movie whatsoever. Like the bit of mythology that they're trying to uh, introduce isn't interesting in the least bit. Um, and the script and dialogue is some of the worst I've seen in any genre, not just a superhero genre, but in any genre. So 30 minutes into the movie, I kind of just threw my hands up and I was like, I don't really understand what's going on. None of this makes any sense to me and, and I don't care. But then the effects in the film are pre 2003. Like there's things that happen in this movie that are part of the quote unquote action scenes that make me just laugh out loud because it, it looks like they spent no money on it and no one cared. Like they just did the least amount possible and put it together in the final cut and then released it out there into the. So I'm stunned at how dated and stale it feels and then how disinterested almost everybody in the film is. I liked Celeste O'Connor. I liked Isabella Merced. I thought both of them tried. I just don't think Sidney Sweeney got much to do in her character. And I thought Dakota Johnson couldn't look more bored. I honestly don't think that she looked like she even wanted to know, be wait, there. Wait till you see her interview with me. Yeah, she looks I even mean, more bored. It's no better. Yeah, it's no better. And I hate this. That press day was really tough because when I went back and rewatched my footage with her, she gave me nothing. Yeah. And I, I thought of the moment I was like, oh, this is an OK answer. I can work with this. And when I watched it back, I was like, oh, there's just nothing there. Nothing. I aired whatsoever. my interview with Dakota Johnson today. Today is Tuesday, uh, February 13th. And uh, whenever I aired my interview, my boss never does. My boss is always like the most supportive you know, person in the world. And my boss steps out of our office and goes, "Ooh, that was like pulling teeth. <laughs> and I was like, and, and I said, and I said, that's what made air. <laughs> <laughs> but you know all all that being said with the interviews i just i don't i i'll be stunned if i see a worse movie this year like i, I it, someone would actively have to try hard to make a worse movie this year and i this is a spider-man this is a, a spider-verse movie i liked morbius more than this i love i like i think the venom movies are much better than this i'm willing to bet sight unseen that craven is better than this it has to be because yeah. this just doesn't even feel like a movie to me so yeah, you know, uh, it's funny. <laughs> the best part for me of this movie was I think Sean and I saw it on the same day and got on the phone that afternoon and just got lost in laughter as we started <laughs> ping-ponging different <laughs> lines and moments that we just couldn't <laughs> believe actually happened. And the conversation <laughs> ended with me gasping for air and laughter as we were just <laughs> reciting lines from the movie. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to double up on everything Sean said, you know, I, I had this moment, you know, going in, I gotta be honest, going into this movie, I was not prepared to, I, I just had a feeling, I, I, you know, I haven't really loved the, the Sony spinoff Marvel films and, and nothing about the trailer or the character uh, really intrigued me. But I think like the first shot of the movie is like, a, I, if I remember right, a really nice like rack focus of like a spider web mm -hmm. in, in the jungle. And I thought like, oh, that's a, a cool shot. And I had just the briefest of moments where I thought, maybe, like just maybe <laughs> this is gonna like, I'm gonna be the asshole and it's gonna turn out that this movie's awesome and how dare I walk in with such negative perceptions of a film sight unseen. And then the character spoke. <laughs> and just completely confirmed all my suspicions. And it just, it's the kind of script where you just want to look at the page and look at the writer and go, you've heard how humans speak, right? Like you, you know how one human speaks to another human, the way in which there is inflection and work, you know, it just feels, you know, uh, you know, Dakota Johnson made a joke about Madam Webb being, uh, uh, the results of, of if AI made it. And there's a part of me that goes, I'd love to see the AI version of this movie because it would probably be better than, than better. whatever it is that we got. Um, yeah. 
unbelievably horrific performances, god awful script. You're absolutely CGI where like, if this had been in the trailer a year ago, even I would have been like, yeah, the movie's not done yet, but they shouldn't put that in the trailer because it's not a good shot. And this is the mm-hmm. finished product. Um, just, and also like at the end of the day, not really the movie that they're advertising it to be. Like it's, it's, it almost reminds me of the major complaint people had about the last Fantastic Four movie, which is that they're not even really the Fantastic Four until the final shot. Yeah, like yeah, you, yeah. you watch two hours to get to the movie mm-hmm. that you thought you were going to watch. And I feel like that's the case with that Madam Web. It's almost two hours. It's like an hour 54. It's two hours to get to the point that I thought that we were going to be at a third of the way through the movie. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, well, and it's, it's credit to the marketing bad. team. Credit to the marketing team, because I think that they looked at the movie that they were given and thought like, <laughs> what we, well, well, you got to do something. With, I would love we to see here? a documentary made about the people who had to cut the Madam Web trailer. <laughs> yeah, it's kind I don't of know. A, Kevin. What did you think? Kind of bizarre. Yeah, this was a, a special kind of awful. Um, I, I, I was, I was, um, like I don't really get fidgety or like annoyed when I'm watching films, but I did not want to sit in that seat anymore. Um, yeah. Everybody well involved in this film deserved better. I mean, there is incredible talent on, on camera and behind the camera in this movie. And it's it's shocking to me that this is the product. Um, every person involved deserves better. Sydney Sweeney deserves better. Dakota Johnson deserves better. Everybody deserves better. Um, I mean, you're talking about very talented actors um, and It's just a mess beyond belief. I I don't even really know or can't comprehend how this was set up and shown to a test audience or a studio. And they said, yeah, let's go ahead and put this thing out. Um, The script is awful. It's I really think this might be one of the worst villains I have ever seen in a movie in my entire life. I don't you're not wrong. It's not that. And that's not an exact. We're not like being hyperbolic. Like it it is. Everything we're saying, I I truly, we all truly believe. Yeah. At the end of the day, I, I take no pleasure in, in, in giving a movie a negative review. And because that means we had to watch it. Right. And when I first started in this job, I always, always in my head had two separate mindsets of what I do for a living. It's my interview perspective and then my review perspective. I remember seeing The Hangover 2 and thinking it was one of the worst comedies I'd ever seen because the first one was so great and still having to walk in and interview Bradley Cooper, Ed Helms, and Zach Galifianakis. I remember Cooper, sometimes they'll ask you what you think of the film and and it's a really interesting thing. So to me, I I, I do that interview with, with the cast. I come home, I don't don't give the movie a good review. I air the interview. That's just how I've always done my job. And at the end of the day, this was just one of the more frustrating experiences I've ever had in a theater um, because you're sitting there thinking to yourself, the millions of dollars that were spent here could have been used for so many other things. Um, and then you have CGI effects that look better in lower budget movies than they do in this film. Like the fact that Godzilla minus one, how, how, whatever budget that was, 15, 20 million dollars, and then whatever budget this was, I don't understand where the correlation, and I understand every, the, the, there's different, um, different CGI artists all over the world, but in this particular instance, I just couldn't believe this was a major motion picture. It looked That's like the thing. A, the, the CGI is so bad in this. Right. That like I, I can't even imagine that the tools that we have right. available to us now can do that. allow you to make something that looks as bad as it does. Right. It was like somebody made this in like Microsoft Paint or something. It was like it was it was it was. It was <laughs> It was just really bad. But then Jake brings up a great point, too. The movie is not being advertised correctly. It's not even the movie that they're advertising. Like, like, I won't even go into details, but there are there are three characters in this film that I thought were supposed to be a bigger part of the actual superhero aspect of the story. And that's all I will say. And and I, I just didn't. And to me, it's it's a it's a it's a bad uh, rendition of Final Destination. It's the yeah. same movie. It's the mm. same story. Is, like, is there uh, a way she, to say, the way I would phrase it is like a major plot line of this movie is that one day the characters will become the people who you think they're going to become in this movie. Right, yeah. right. But they <laughs> don't. Yeah. yeah, and I don't even know if this was, I would love to have asked SJ, I wasn't part of the interview, um, but there's a moment where Dakota's driving behind a truck with logs on it, which I thought was a Final Destination 2 reference. Oh, interesting. Because, I, I, yeah. dude, every time I see a, a truck with logs, I think Final Destination yeah. 2. 
the opening of Final Destination 2 will oh, forever be ingrained Ooh. in my mind. Ooh. But I, I just, it's funny, I was watching it thinking, I want to go home and watch Final Destination because it's such a better version of this. It's the exact uh, same situation. She can see in the future. She's trying to protect these people from what's good, about to come. That's a good it's the same pull. thing. Um, and I just, yeah, I just, it's so frustrating. Like, I can't begin to describe to you. I, I haven't been that frustrated with a film in a long time. And I take no pleasure in saying that. And I, and I, and I really wish, I really wish the people who were involved in this film were given better material. That's really well, all I this can is say. What, Kev, I know you didn't sit in on the S.J. Clarkson interview, but what breaks my heart is that at one point in the interview, she says to Jake and I, she's like, we literally just finished this like last week. Yeah, we were we were putting our, our blood, sweat and tears into the Ugh. visual effects to make them as good as possible so that you got. And, and I, I thought to myself in mid interview, I was like, are you kidding me? Like. That's well, well, the qualifier was as possible. Yeah. <laughs> also, I, mean, I guess so. Yeah. And like you guys just finished last week. When did you start? Right. <laughs> you start two weeks ago. <laughs> what I'm, what I mean, I, I want to, I want to. I haven't seen this film for anyone at home listening, but we, I, we do get this criticism a little bit, and I tend to understand where people are coming from. We can't just give a blanket, you know, CGI is bad. Uh, you did a wrong thing. And we have, and I know you guys have all said this separately, but we're having fun. So I just want to highlight this for people at home. CGI is hard. It doesn't yeah. matter how much money you have. It, it requires time. Sure. And sure. Even yes. on these big productions, they are not allowed the time required to make it good. Sure. Right. For all the VFX artists out here that listen to this show or are out there, we appreciate yeah. you. Know we all can we do it. Yeah. I just want we to highlight very, that because yeah. we're having no. fun, but I, we get that comment a lot, and I understand where people are no. coming from. I, I think whenever I, and I would, I'm going to speak on behalf of the guys, whenever I criticize CGI, in my mind, I'm not criticizing the artists who do it. I'm criticizing what I'm assuming is the time constraints and, and yeah, right. the professional circumstances that were thrust upon them that yielded the product that we got. This is the point I, I want to close this out on. I don't understand... Like this movie doesn't have a reason to exist in this sense. It's part of it's part of a cinematic universe, whether you like it or not. But it doesn't serve any purpose in the cinematic universe that it's allegedly made for. I don't get what Sony is doing with yeah. their with their rights to the Spider-Man character. I get the fact that they lent um Tom Holland over to Marvel. Fine. But if you're choosing as a studio to make Madam Web and Craven the Hunter and you haven't started the process of a live action Miles Morales movie, then you don't care. Mm. If you're not figuring out how to bring Andrew Garfield into all of this somehow, then you don't care because nobody is going to these movies excited for the introduction of Madam Web or Craven hey, the Hunter. Can, can, I, can I interrupt really quick? Sure. Uh, IGN announcing producer Amy Pascal confirms a live action Miles Morales. Okay, they care. No, they but care, like, folks, they she care. said this yesterday where she said soon, but like first we're going to make Spider-Man 4 with, with Marvel and we're going to finish out the Spider-Verse animated trilogy, which fine, I understand all that. That could be like 20 years. But if you're making these individual Sony Spider-Man movies, they have to either build towards something or be good as standalone movies. And this movie does neither. Of Can those I things. give the most cynical take? And I'm saying I'm presenting this as not as like necessarily what I believe is happening, but the most cynical read of anything to see where it probably falls, you know, a little bit further towards the middle. Is there a world where at the Sony brass is just making things with this IP to retain the rights to make sure. money off the MCU? Like they're, that they're was worried the about making MCU <laughs> money and they're just trying to keep the rights so they can make money off the MCU. Yes, but. Then I would argue that they need to be making standalone movies. movies about <laughs> villains or just choose villains that people care about. Like yeah. it, the El Muerto movie that got killed. Who the fuck wants that? <laughs> you know, who wants I mean, Madam Web? There's an audience I, for El Muerto. I mean, like that was that that could have been big. Bad Bunny is a. Oh, okay. Big name. Is there an audience for El Muerto or an audience for Bad Bunny? Well, I think Bad Bunny would make El Muerto the, what, what it would be. Also, uh, one thing I want to ask you guys: Who dropped the ball worse uh, in terms of superhero films in the superhero universe that they're creating? Warner Brothers or Sony? Currently, Sony. I'd say Sony. You think Currently Sony's Sony. dropping the ball worse than what Warner on Brothers this, did with on like this iteration? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I haven't seen the second Aquaman yet. 
Um, but Cause the say, flat, say what you the want. Flash is yeah. much better. Yeah, I would say say what you want to about DC. I liked a lot of the DC movies. Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, I, the Suicide so Squad's good. Is good. I, but, I no, think but even the try, ones that came post Snyder, yeah, they try too hard to be Marvel. Yeah, yeah. But I put it this way: we we compare DC to the MCU, and we're comparing Sony to DC. Like I think that's yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah, good. And we're comparing Sony to Fox circa twenty yeah. <laughs> sure, two thousand and three. Sure, sure, yeah. So that's a problem uh, if that's your also, bar. And I said this on the show when we did our most anticipated coming up this year. I I think that Deadpool three is going to be that reset, which is why it's so funny in the trailer when when Reynolds goes, "Was he say I'm Marvel Jesus?" Marvel I mean, Jesus. That, he they know that that movie it needs to do what it needs to do to reset that fandom and get everybody excited again. That just yes, needs to do. happen. Yeah. All right, let's throw it to a break. We'll be back on the other side. We're going to review Bob Marley One Love. And we are back. Okay, so in addition to Madam Web reaching theaters, if you guys want to go see something else, uh, we have Bob Marley, One Love, which stars Kingsley Ben-Adir, uh, who's been a couple of things up until this point, most notably uh, Secret Invasion, and then him playing Malcolm X in uh, Regina King's terrific film, One Night in Miami. Um, I went into this not necessarily knowing what to expect. I wasn't sure if it was a, a birth to death type uh, musical biopic or um, just what it ended up becoming, which was a slice of life at the time of this musician where uh, Bob Marley was trying to put together a concert for peace um, to get sort of above and outside the politics um, of his native island community of, I'm sorry, I'm blanking now. Is it Jamaica? Is that Jamaica. where, is that where you're from? Yep. Um, and I thought that that was the right way to approach this story. I knew very little about Bob Marley going into it. I don't listen to a lot of Bob Marley music. Of course, I know a lot of his big songs and everything. Um, but to learn about the pressures that he was facing <clears throat> back home in terms of trying to help the political unrest and then him wrestling with that as an artist of not necessarily wanting to get into that. Uh, and wanting to just create the music and hope that the music sort of unifies the people, I thought was a really interesting way to tell his story. Um, I thought Kingsley ben was terrific. Really, really liked him a lot. And and it does one of those things that they sort of did with Bradley Cooper's film Maestro, where you get to see actual footage of the man uh, over the credits. And then it made me realize how close Kingsley ben got to a lot of his physical motions on the stage, the choreography that, that um, Bob Marley had. There's some really good, uh, which, you know, seemed like requisite, you know, to put into a, a, a musician's story like this scenes in the recording industry uh, or in the recording studios where they're putting together some of their most popular music. And I like the fact that he was often at odds with the other musicians in his band, the Wailers. Um, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I was really entertained by it. It wasn't the sort of beat by beat. Oh, now is the time where you're going to get to this part of, of his story. Now is the time where we're going to transition. This one didn't feel formulaic in that sense at all. There were some complicated things going on in his um, emotional relationships that I found to be really interesting. And um, Lashana Lynch was fantastic uh, in her part as Bob Marley's wife. So overall, I thought it was really good. Like, I, I genuinely enjoyed it. I thought the concert scenes when they did come were really entertaining, but weren't dominated. Um, and the stuff that I learned about him as an artist really held my interest. So I would recommend this film to people, even if you're not a huge Bob Marley fan. It's interesting. We've seen a couple other movies like Rocket Man or Bohemian Rhapsody that are so steeped in the music of the artist. And it really is just like, a, here's how they wrote this song. And then here's how they wrote that song. I didn't think he even had to be a huge Bob Marley fan in order to appreciate the things that he was going through as an artist and and the pressure of the politics that were weighing down on him. There's even a, a moment where he goes back to London and London at that time was sort of being driven by the underground punk scene. And there's stuff that he pulls out of that as well, too, the way that they were sort of fighting back against power and authority. And he works that into some of his music. It's a great sequence where he hears like a soundtrack from a movie that inspires him. And it goes on to essentially what the story becomes is the Exodus. creation of his movie Exodus. Yeah, oh, his album Exodus, which, again, I'm ignorant and didn't realize how successful that movie, that uh, album was. Time magazine named it like the album of the decade or something that it came out. Uh, was so, it the album of the century or something like album that? Album of the century, was it? So, yeah, I mean, and it's really funny. Like there are there are moments where he has to uh 
push back against the marketing team, you know, at the record label. Uh, it was played by James Gandolfini's son, who I thought was funny in the movie. Um, yeah, no, I mean, in general, I just really appreciated the approach to not being so formulaic to the biopic format. And um, I would I would recommend this one to anyone, even if you're a Bob Marley fan or not. Uh, I think I'm the most positive. I, I, you, well, you guys didn't really dial into it as much as I did. I mean, I liked I liked aspects of it. I think this is a classic example of performances being better than the movie. Okay. Um, I thought Kingsley ben was incredible. I thought Lashana Lynch was incredible as Rita. Um, I to me, anytime uh, Lashana Lynch and Kingsley ben were on screen together, the movie just worked beautifully. Um, there's there, there are sequences where these characters are just having dialogue back and forth as husband and wife, and it's really to me, those were the m more interesting moments of the film. Um, in terms of like the movements and the physicalities, he really does become him. Um, and shout out to Polly Bennett, who we talked, who we brought up in our interview with Ben, ben Kingsley Benadier, who did the movement for Elvis and did uh, for for Austin Butler's Elvis and did the movement coaching for uh, Rami Malek and, and Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, you know, they Kingsley really captures the 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 essence of Bob Marley in a way of like the just the physicality and the movements and and the way um, the important aura that surrounded him and kind of his mission in terms of like how important the music was to him. And I think he's like a live wire day, on stage when you see him moving around. Yeah, he's got like this, this jolt to him that Kingsley nailed. Yeah. And I think like, like you look at Austin Butler, like Austin Butler really captured the essence of Elvis. And like there's something there's that there's there's something about uh, the way a musician moves. And I think that's really a lot with Polly Bennett, who's an I just want to highlight her because I think she's an incredible movement coach that really um, if you've seen like footage of Bohemian Rhapsody behind the scenes, you could see her dancing in front of Rami Malek as he's doing the Live Aid concert. And again, that whole essence of, of Freddie Mercury. And so no one's ever for, done the Rolling Stones. And I kind of wonder because yeah. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards both move so specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be really tough for a it young actor be. to play either of those two. I, yeah. That just jumped to mind. It would be. But in terms of this film, uh, I think what, one thing I do love about the message of this movie is the power of music and kind of what mm -hmm. it can do. It, it could just unify. It, it really has such a powerful element to it. And just like when 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 we're seeing Bob Marley at these concerts, essentially risking his life in a way to to get that music out there and that, and that message out there um, on the negative side. I didn't think the film was well directed. Um, mm. I thought, again, I think the performances are better than the movie, but it's it just felt uneven to me. It didn't feel polished. It didn't feel like it had. Um, a confidence in its storytelling. Um, I thought the actors had the confidence like Lashana Lynch and, and Kingsley ben -Adir, To me, that's the movie. Um, so if you do go see it, you will learn some cool stuff about Bob Marley. I didn't know the whole Exodus story. I don't know if that's true or not, but in, in the scene we're talking about, there was, I guess there was a movie called Exodus and he found a record and that became like the, the, uh, the inspiration for that, which I thought was really mm -hmm. cool. I did not know that. Um, I love scenes like that where, where you see musicians, come yeah. up with stuff in the moment you know some of the best uh mu musical biopic scenes are when they explain the origin of uh, what becomes a very famous song yeah i kind of yeah. love that and so to me like i like i'm i'm kind of more in the middle ground i didn't love the film but i liked it i liked aspects of it and i think that mm -hmm. it's not it's not a movie you should just throw to the side there's some really good content and some really good performances some really great music um from what i understand i think i read this he, he uh, Kingsley ben -Adir does the singing on the set and the playing oh, on the set. I wondered that. Oh, I, I, I didn't answer then, that because he told okay. me in the interview. So he was not supposed to sing in the movie. So I believe that Bob Marley was going to be used and they were also going to bring um, his son in to do uh, vocals as well. And then he said he sort of just was surprised to learn that they just never ended up replacing him. Um, so he, oh, wow. he, he said he, he took singing lessons and classes for himself because he felt like he couldn't pull off this performance unless he knew what it felt like to right. sing on stage but it's not, not his voice the in the purpose. movie uh it's a little it's it's his Certainly. mixed with bob marley oh interesting is my interesting. understanding yes so it's it is uh -huh. it, so it is his him singing but with bob marley sort of blended cool. in I, as well i thought they did it like bohemian cool. rhapsody where like rami sang on set and yeah. then they put in mercury's voice because like there's a moment where correct me if I'm wrong, because Sean, you saw you saw it more recently than I did, where he's sitting around the he's sitting around with his family. I think he's singing a redemption song mm -hmm. in that moment. I think that's him singing there. 
But I okay. think during the live performances, I, I want to say, and I could be wrong, let us know that he, he, he just told me singing. that it was a blend. It's interesting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So maybe it is a blend. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Jakey, did yeah. you want to th- throw anything else out? Uh, really quickly, I, I don't want to like bring the conversation down. The movie did not work for me. I do agree with you that it's 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 a pretty remarkable performance. But like, and this is such a, a lazy word in in reviewing. But I honestly found the film to be boring. Um, mm. I, I I am with you in that I did not really know much about anything of Bob Marley. And while I did walk away with facts, I guess um, there are nothing that I I couldn't have learned. Uh, from spending two minutes glancing through his Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel like I didn't truly walk away with like an understanding of of him as a man. I I got on the surface the things that the film was trying to tell me. But again, there, if I had taken, you know, a couple of minutes to to do any kind of research leading up to the movie, which I didn't because I kind of wanted to be surprised by what happened. um, I... I, I could have found. In fact, I went to his Wikipedia page to read more on the man before the interview, and felt like I got a better understanding of oh, who that's he was. Interesting. Uh, based on uh, from that and some things that the, the movie didn't even uh, give me. Um, so, so the movie did not uh, work for me as a biopic. Interesting. Yeah, I, I would disagree. I think I thought that I got a pretty good sense of him. You know, what inspired his music and his roots. But um, sure, eh, eh, we sh- we shall see. Yeah. We'll see how it does. I'm not. You know. I, I'm so disappointed by the box office in general. And so yeah. I'm really curious how each of these movies are going to do. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the weekend shapes up, but we'll talk about that next week. Um, reminder, uh, we have Kingsley Benadir on the show. Uh, he's part of last week's main episode. Uh, we have a standalone episode with Bob Marley director, Reynaldo Marcus Green. Please go back and check out each of those. And then if you go see either Adam Webb or Bob Marley, let us know your reviews in the comments. All right, before we round out this week's episode, we're going to play a very fun game called the 2014 Oscars in Review. We're heading to the Academy Awards. Not us physically. We're not going to the ceremony or anything. Speak for yourself. Um, yeah, you don't Oscars know. You don't know my life. Are, are coming up, uh, and Gabe is taking us back 10 years uh, in the Wayback Machine to Oscars 2014, which... I can't off the top of my head remember what <clears throat> year this I. is. It'll come back to you quickly. Generally, what we do is we go back over the main categories so uh, and try and decide whether movies, the movies, but the 2014 Oscars. 2014 yeah. Oscars celebrating the movies of 2013. Sure. So, Gabe, take it away. Uh, yeah. So, if you haven't listened to uh, the premium show back in the day or heard us do this before, um, as Sean was saying, we're just going to go through a few of the um, major categories as we have time. We might bounce around a couple, uh, check a couple others if we have time for it. The idea here being um, we always talk about how the Oscars, you know, get it wrong or that we should do the Oscars, you know, 10 years later, yada, yada. Uh, it's it's kind of fun to look back and see what won and uh, sort of of our recollection or things that, you know, have stuck with us or that we've rewatched, uh, how our opinions might differ from the Academy. So it usually yes, makes us mad. It usually ends it up just making us Sometimes mad. It's good. This is uh, <laughs> the most recent one I think we've done because I think I've stayed away from doing anything more recent than 10 years um so yes this is the 2014 oscars celebrating the movies of 2013 and we're going to start out with actor in a supporting role nominated we have jonah hill for the wolf of wall street oh Ooh. this is it's that year michael fassbender <laughs> for 12 years a slave bradley cooper for american hustle uh barkhad abdi i believe i said his name right uh for captain phillips and winning is jared leto for dallas buyers club I yeah. agree with that. I'm okay with that. Yeah, that's Leto? it's him. Yeah. Uh, Do you like the nominees? Barkad Abdi, because uh, his performance in Captain Phillips is tremendous. It's, mm-hmm. I think I he's mean, the all only those other performances are, are pretty remarkable. Like those, you Jonah know, Hill. For, Jonah Hill's great in Wolf of Wall is Street. Is it for, for Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah. That the scene that would have I think would could give him would have given him the Oscar was when he's choking on the on the bologna or the ham. <laughs> That whole sequence when like when DiCaprio comes back from the country club and he's like crawling yeah. and they like, get into a fight and that whole sequence is that's why I always think that that's DiCaprio's best performance because the physicality of that role both of them are amazing but I would give it to Leto Leto's incredible of, in that of that group like I'm legitimately I and I, I had not that I've watched Twelve Years a Slave but like I kind of forget Michael Fassbender's even in that movie oh, like, oh dude he's, he's in that I movie. think of Chiwetel and I think yeah. of um, Lupita. 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 Yeah, I think Lupita's performance, but I kind of forget 
but he's in it. Isn't yeah, Giamatti in it too? Doesn't Giamatti play a guy who like purchases slaves early yeah, on? Yeah, Giamatti, uh, Brad Pitt's in it. Uh, Paul Dano's Pitt's in, in it. it too. He produced um, it, right? Was yeah, that he one produced of his... it, and, and he, it he's is a in plan it. He's in B one. Yeah, and he, yeah. He, in fact, he that was his first Oscar. Yeah, I would like to go back and revisit that. I mean, Steve McQueen's an incredible director. It's yeah, just such really a difficult is, film to sit through. It's just sure. such a tough, tough you know, movie. But speaking of jo- you know a Jonah Hill performance, I was watching last night. I didn't I didn't like have enough time to watch the full two hour movie, so I just like kind of got stuck watching the scenes. Dogs. Watching scenes on YouTube. No, is Moneyball. Every time I see a clip from Moneyball, yeah. I just want to watch God. Moneyball. If, 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 you, if someone told so me good. that's the their, the best sports movie ever made, I would not yeah. argue with them. It's, it's so good. I think it might I, be. I, that, with every year that passes, I really do think like that might be the best sports movie ever made. Every yep. scene hits because well, hey, no pun intended. How, how did uh, Sorkin not get an Oscar for that screenplay? I don't know. It's one of his. It's one of his best. It really is one of his. The the the, the, mon, the or the yeah, I would call it a monologue from the uh, the Red Sox manager at the end about yeah. baseball changing and that that's just it just it just rings Sorkin. I, I scene, just want, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, the scene around the table with all the old scouts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Billy explaining why they're going after these yeah. other guys and he keeps he points la, at la, Jonah. La, la. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why do we want him? He gets on base. <laughs> gets on base, <laughs> guys. If you don't answer, I'm gonna point it. I'm gonna point yeah, it. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna point at him again. <laughs> My, my favorite so is it, it, it's a, it's a line <laughs> from an actor who you can't even see on screen in the moment when he says it, he says that you know Brad Pitt is that line of we're, we're sitting here like we're like we're looking for Fabio and another guy goes uh, who's Fabio and then and then you hear someone else even further and go I think he's a second baseman in Milwaukee <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that's good the scene the most recently that I saw was it's just Brad Pitt's just nailing it he's talking to the vet that they get from the Yankees. And he's yeah. kind of like big time. And he's like, yeah, don't talk to me like these guys. I get what you're doing, whatever. And he goes, you pay me. He goes, oh, you think you're special. And he goes, well, you're paying me seven million dollars. So maybe a little. He goes, nope. He goes, the Yankees are paying you three and a half million dollars to play against them. He goes, yeah. that's what you are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. So good. Yes, Sorkin. So good. Or also the scene that I just saw. It's so fun. Let's just do Moneyball for the rest of this. I'm down, I'm down. <laughs> Where Pitt sits there across from Philip Seymour Hoffman. He's like, you can't start or you're, you're going to start so-and-so first base. And he's like, Billy, I told you, I, I owe the lineup card. And he's like, well, I just traded him away. He's yeah. playing for so-and-so. God, and then I Jeremy think- Giambi comes in. Jeremy, you're going to the Phillies. Yeah. <laughs> Reach out to this guy. Yeah. Talk to him. <laughs> You're I, killing this team. I, I only interviewed Philip Seymour Hoffman one time um, and I'm trying to think I don't I can't remember what the question was the question was I guess something along the lines of like things you've had to learn for a role that you otherwise wouldn't have learned and I, I'll never forget he told me he was like right now I'm shooting this movie um, about baseball where I have to like like play you know be a, ba- a baseball manager and he goes I know nothing about it. and at the time I had no idea that what he was talking about was mm-hmm. Moneyball. Um, but yeah, that, I'll never forget that part of the interview. And then, and then, like, of course, a year later, I'm like, son of a bitch, he was talking about Moneyball. <laughs> the good when he's, it's a metaphor. Jonah Hill's like, it's a metaphor. Goes, I know it's a metaphor. I know it's a metaphor. So good. Uh, all right. Moving on. Back yeah. on topic, I guess. Actress in a supporting role. Uh, nominated. We have June Squibb for Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Uh, Julia Roberts for August Osage. Wait. Hubie yeah. Halloween's June Squibb. That's right. Yes, yes, that's correct. exactly right. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. That's exactly right. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence for American Hustle. Sally um. Hawkins uh, in Blue Jasmine. And winning, we have Lupita Nyongo for 12 Years a Slave. Yeah, you got to give it to Lupita. Lupita. Yeah. No Lupita. Brainer. She also no should have been nominated for us. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think you She no wasn't question. nominated? She wasn't even nominated. What? Us, yeah. us is her best performance and she was Because even the Oscars don't oh, respect oh, horror oh, films. Oh, I thought you said I thought you meant she should have been nominated for the Critics Association that year. Oh, no, sorry. sorry no. I was like, yeah, you guys sorry, didn't nominate her? Yeah. I was like, <laughs> Oh, um, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know we went through a stretch where, like, David O. Russell was getting nom- like his movies were getting pushed, The Fighter and Civil Lions Playbook. Yeah, yeah, I- yeah. I don't think American Hustle is that good. I no. neither do I. I, I, no. I actively do not think. I do think ba- Bale's great, though. Bale is awesome. Bale's really movie. good. It has- the, the performance, performance wise. I don't think I've liked an O. Russell movie since The Fighter. I thought you were going to say Three Kings. Great movie. Oh, yeah. I like Silver Lines Playbook a lot. I thought it was, um, I, I think it's fine. So oh, I think it's fun. good. Yeah, so I love good. Silver Linings. Joy is not that three, good. Three Kings, Joy, man. Joy is not that three good. Three Kings is three great. Kings. Yeah, Joy is kind of mediocre. He doesn't like Three Kings. George Clooney. That's a shame because he's good in it. Well, well, did he and O. Russell like? Didn't they? They didn't fought he, they, on yeah. set. Yeah, yeah. And doesn't he? He doesn't he like fucking fight with everybody? Yeah, I think he's just yeah. an asshole. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. an asshole. Yeah, yeah. 
He um, got in a fight with Lily Tomlin. Lily Tomlin, the, who is the, maybe the, the sweetest Huckabees. woman in the world. And Mark Wahlberg, who also, yeah. I mean, say what you will about Mark Wahlberg. I think he gets along with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so. But yeah, um, the, the yeah. American Hustle got a ton of nominations and I, yeah, I don't really that see. That, yeah, that, I feel like that was like after American Hustle that year at the Oscars, the Academy sort of went like, wait, do we do we all not like his movies that much? Can we all, can we all agree to not like them that much? Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. The, show, yeah. the, the point that Sean kind of was making, but... Uh, yeah, it kind of feels like it was just a uh, 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 going with emotions. Yeah, type all of a sudden nomination. he was like Alexander Payne material. Yeah. It's like whoa, 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 whoa. But wasn't was American Hustle the last time that um, a movie got all four acting nominations? Maybe but I think we're going to find out. Yeah, because yeah. I think I think it got Bale, Amy Lawrence, Adams, Amy Adams, it. and uh, and Bradley Cooper. Cooper. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, keeping it moving. We have actor in a leading role uh, nominated. We have Chiwetel. Ad- Echo four, Echo four, Echo four. What was it? Kind of C H Echo. I think it's I think it's Chuatel Echo four. Echo four. Should I could be wrong? I'm telling you right now. I don't care who else it is. Should have won. <laughs> oh, I, I I have a different should have won. Uh, Twelve Years a Slave, nominated for Twelve Years a Slave. We have Leonardo DiCaprio in The Wolf of Wall Street. There it is. Bruce Stern Not over for Nebraska. Christian Bale in American Hustle and winning. Bringing the reconnaissance oh. to its head, we have Matthew McConaughey, Dallas Buyers Club. I would give it to DiCaprio for Wolf of Wall Street. I think that's the best performance of his career. He should have won for that. I don't think he should have won for The Revenant. That's the one he should have won for. I do think he should have won for The Revenant, but I also would give it to him for Wolf of Wall Street. Let me ask you this. I I, I don't love, I don't know. I, I subscribe to him. Sometimes I don't. The, the, the why someone won an Oscar. But McConaughey had not only such a um, great narrative of sort of, you know, that, that this return of like how great of an actor he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, correct me if I'm wrong, the timing of the Oscars was, wasn't it also like right when True Detective was airing? Yes. And so I, I, I and the same True Detective way that, was like, airing while the yeah. voting was happening. And yeah. I just really feel like that. Re- in, in the same way that yeah. I truly believe that Norbit coming out when they voted for the Oscars kept yeah. Eddie Murphy <laughs> from winning is yeah. the uh, and the opposite. I think kind of happened with uh, with McConaughey, where like True Detective comes out. Well, I, I think True Detective is the best performance of McConaughey's career. Yeah, and I I will say that if I'm ranking these performances, McConaughey it's not better than Interstellar, dude, is probably I, I'm just saying against these five performances, these the ones in he's this great. category he's, that he's, he's really competing great. against. He, he's, he's still great. nominate I'm not him. You'd yeah. still nominate him. I yeah. think oh, Chiwetel oh. and I think Leo are probably ahead of him in this category. But his performance in Dallas Buyers Club is really good. Incredible. He, yeah. he didn't win yeah. for a for a bit. You're, a you're not wrong. You're not, like you can't. You can't knock that win. It's not no, one of those where you throw your arms up in the air and go, oh, my great. God, how did you know? Like him and Jared Leto are fantastic yeah. in that film. Yeah, yeah they're both yeah, great. Because, I mean, don't, don't forget, he's also in Wolf of Wall Street with Leo. And he was great in that. <laughs> and he's true. great in that. Yeah. Yes. That's true. Oh, yeah. That's when he still like that's those those roles that he still was at, like his Dallas Buyers Club. Yeah. Remember there, remember, there was like a three year mm-hmm. period where I think collectively, we, collectively, we all went, what the shit? Where where did this guy come from? And then and then you saw Dallas Buyers Club. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went back and rewatched that Wolf of Wall Street scene. like at the, the restaurant. Great. Mm-hmm. It's so didn't, great. Isn't that ad lib? I've, I've always yeah. heard that, that's, that, that he just made that up. McConaughey added that in. I read, I read McConaughey's book, Green Lights, and I could have this wrong, but I'm pretty sure that he sat down and did that. And then I think DiCaprio thought it was funny. I mean, and that's a classic. Added it in. That's yeah, a classic. That's Scors- what Scorsese happen. thing yeah. is like, you Would know. You, yeah. You remember um, McConaughey's films up to that point? I mean, he went through a stretch where he was making some terrible yeah. movies. Remember Fool, Fool's Gold? He was making yeah, a lot of money, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. He was. Dude, yeah. Sure. listen. Absolutely. Listen, how how yeah. to lose a guy in 10 days is great. That's sure. interesting. Yeah. That's an, oh, that's, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to your point, like, now these days i feel like as much shit as we gave him for like those kind of rom-coms that he was making that he was great in them like now i like i would strive for like now i think we're all so desperate for those kind of rom-coms which is a reason why kevin going back to one of your original points why anything but you is blowing up because like we're so desperate like my god sometimes we just need those movies glenn powell could do five of those oh god yes in a row and just crush about to be the it dude i agree with you 100 percent and everyone in my newsroom was like who's the guy in that twisters trailer i'm like you, yeah. you you mean the guy from the biggest Top movie Gun. of like the last 
But he was like years, like fifth built in that movie. You also for you also forget that he gets the hero moment in sure. Top Gun Maverick. He has the moment, like the very moment of the movie is Glenn Powell, like when he saves, yeah. when he saves uh, uh, Miles Teller well, and also, Tom Cruise. He looks like Glenn Powell. Yeah, that's true too. Let's just, let's just that's cut right great. to it. It would be it would be pretty cool though if if this went full circle and Matthew McConaughey starred in a really great rom com in the next couple of years. He, I it's bet you really he will. Great. How to lose a How to lose a guy in eleven days? 20, Twenty days. <laughs> how to lose an Oscar in ten days? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's let's keep it moving because we Dallas do have to wrap Byers up. Clubs. We do have to wrap up here soon. We have a couple categories left. Uh, actress in a leading role nominated. We have uh, as always. Uh, Meryl Streep, August Osage County, uh, mm. Judy Dench in Philomena, Sandra Bullock in Gravity, Amy Adams in American Hustle, and Kate Blanchett winning in Blue Jasmine. Bullock. She, Bullock for Gravity. No, no Kate, Kate Blanchett deserves to win. She's phenomenal yeah. in Blue Jasmine. I, I, it's been, look, phenomenal. I think I only saw Blue Jasmine during that awards circuit. And I remember not, and I, one, I love Kate Blanchett, so I remember not Blown particularly being, but, but like, I just rewatched Gravity with Adrian because she'd never seen it before. And halfway through, I just remembered like, oh, I mean, I mean, the, the, the joke being is that, you know, the, this show, really its origins go back to Gravity. Um, <laughs> that performance, like I, I prefer her in Gravity over the movie that she won the Oscar for. She won the Oscar for Blindside and I would take it oh, yeah. uh, over oh, yeah. Gravity. Her, her it's a one man show, really. The physicality of her performance in Gravity is remarkable. Um, and I don't think people stop to think sometimes that not, that all of that was done in a volume of some sort. And mm. she had to act all that out like it was real. Like that is genuine acting. It just is like it, like that is actual acting to create a believable, immersive experience when we know you're in a, a motion performance capture setting or volume of some sort. I mean, it's just wild to me, man. She's incredible. I'm not going to say she isn't. But if you guys get a chance and, and I know we're always so swamped. I've seen it. It's good. Kate Jasmine's Kate Blanchett's Blue Jasmine performance is the best of her career. And that's saying a lot because, yeah, I think so. I think she's incredible in Blue Jasmine. Jakey, can I throw um, a couple of or would you rather I save this for the end? A couple of nominations that that should have have been mentioned. I was going to say for best actor or uh, that just Uh, just because we oh that we just did Uh, quickly, quickly. But I have two more categories I got to get to and we need to wrap. Uh, the f- I w- I'm going to just because I'm just kind of going through of what was came out that year. Um, a nomination that did not happen to Best Actor that I would argue in my mind should have won Tom Hanks, Captain Phillips, which I think you can make mm-hmm. a really mm-hmm. solid argument is That's one, one of, of if not his snubs. best performances. Um, yeah. Also, Hugh Jackman in Prisoners, which I think is his best oh, performance. Yeah. I mean, Prisoners. Um, and and Kevin, shame. I know this. I'll say this just because I know you're a fan. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix and her. Oh, yeah. No, oh, dude. Wow. Joaquin, her, her is probably... I'm my favorite. Yeah, so some major yeah. best actor snubs, um, but I, I I will never understand Tom Hanks not getting a, a best actor Captain Phillips oh, nomination. Yeah. So, so I know, that, I know that's I know that's us taking a step backward, but he was no I longer the captain, Jake. He's not the captain. He's not the captain captain anymore. (laughs) Also, not that it's an Oscar movie, but a 2013 (laughs) movie that I truly love and probably watch once a year is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. One of the best needle drops in the history of movies. Sure. Space Oddity by yes, David Bowie. Yep. All right. Moving on. Sean Penn's name was Sean O'Connell. These kind of these two categories are kind of back to back. That's uh, right. <laughs> we have to best or we have directing, best director. Uh nominated. We have Martin Scorsese for The Wolf of Wall Street, Steve McQueen for Twelve Years a Slave, Alexander Ooh, Payne for Nebraska, David O. Russell for American Hustle. Hey. Uh, and winning, we have Alfonso Cuaron for Gravity. You got to give no the question. Cuaron. Yeah, no you got to give it to Alfonso. What a category, though. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's I, I, was to, I was getting ready to say Scorsese. Well, except for American Hustle, though, right? Like, I think yeah. we all agree that's kind of... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no question, Cuaron. You know who again. I would put? You know what? Because Jake just mentioned it, so maybe it's top of mind, but I, I would put Denis in here over Denis? Russell. Denis? Yeah, for, for Prisoners? Prisoners? Yeah. I mean 100%. that movie is that's a perfect movie to me. Like yeah. I, I can't and think it's of almost a time. Like, and and green, green green grass for Captain Phillips. Oh sure. The industry. It's like the industry wasn't on the Denis bandwagon yet. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I still think about that whistle. Oh man. Yeah. He found him. He found him. 
He found him. The sound of that uh, whistle. Uh, dude, Gyllenhaal's him. great in that movie. You know what's dude, so funny is that amazing. I love that movie so much. And you know, like, you know, like I, I think one of all of our love language is watching a movie you love with someone who's never seen it. Yes. Sure. And yeah. I so, so, so badly, because Adrian watched Dune with me. Um, she had never seen it and loved it. And it was like, okay, what else has this guy done? Um, she can't, she has a daughter. She has an eight-year-old daughter and she oh, can't God. really watch movies where, where kids Abduction. are harmed or, you know, anything. Yeah. And I can't bring myself to put that movie in front. Even as, yeah, as, as good as the movie is. What about Arrival? Did you show her Arrival? I don't think oh. I can't show her. I don't think that I show be, her Arrival that would be either. Even I, think Kevin, I think Kevin, you and I were talking about this. So I can't she, show her Arrival. So she hasn't seen two of the best movies ever made uh, by the current best I, I just, uh, working director if she, in the if world. If she were to watch, you know, but I just can't. I can't be the person that puts that in front of her, knowing that she has a tough time with those. It'd be, it would be like someone who no, no. This is not the, this is not an equitable comparison, and I by no means do I do I mean. You to, might want to yeah. stop. Now. <laughs> I was gonna say you've already. You've already, you've already, you've already I, told I was me gonna say like this. like someone who like loves their 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 you know golden lab, be oh, like, okay, hey, here's okay. Marley and me. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Why I, would why I, would you I, put I that will, in front of them? I would argue this, uh, and, and then we've got to move on. I would argue against showing her prisoners, but this I would argue fairy. Right, I would argue yeah. for Arrival. Um, I don't, because I, I, I do think that Arrival will lead you and Adrian to very interesting discussions. Because a I discussion think for sure. The end mm -hmm. of that film is next to Gone Baby Gone. Are the two? Don't show sure Gone Baby Gone yeah. either. Yeah. Well, Gone Baby Gone has a good ending. Well, not really, but yeah. I guess the, 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 the kid, the kid's alive, and the, the baby is gone. <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, but I guess the point I'm making is. I think both of those endings are so interesting topic of conversations to chew on. And I think sure. that Arrival isn't as brutal. It's more just like, it's, it's uh, brutal, it's but, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's just, it's just sure. more I get, I get what you're saying. And I would, I would like to have, just because that, that, you know, the great thing about movies is that it yields to me really amazing conversations. Oh, and I'd love to have that conversation with her. To, to your well, point. think about like, the conversation, like, like when you have it with somebody, it's like, what would you do in that situation? Sure. Do you, like, and, and we won't spoil it people who haven't seen it, but like, the ending if is you know, so you know. interesting. This, here, here's the thing about those two movies. I'm glad you say this, and this is why I only have jokingly say that to me, Denis is the best working director alive right now. I just, I love Denis. Arrival is about the amount of pain you will put yourself through for your children. Right. Prisoners is about the amount of pain you will put on others for oh, your children. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yep. And I think That's, that he was very. Have much you ever said that before, that. or is that something you just came up with in the moment? I think I just came up with that in the moment. That, yeah. That's really that, good. That was dude. That's I feel really like if good. you said that to Denis, he'd lose his shit. Yeah. Anyway, follow us on social media at uh, Jake's Takes. At, let's, let's get out of this. Like, we're not going to do much I, better than that, Gabe. Come on. Damn. Can, can, can I ask you all a quick question? Uh, so, just spoiler alert for people who haven't seen Arrival. Like, the Renner character, I always wondered if she needed to tell him. And I think that I don't. I still can't. I, that ending still destroys me I, on so I many levels. I wouldn't want to know. Do you have the kid? Do you not have the kid? Without oh. giving anything away, I wouldn't want to know. I can't. Oh. I can't. No. Oh. Can, I also just want to just briefly before we get to picture, just praise Alfonso Cuarón for for winning for something like Gravity and yes. something like Roma. Yeah. Like the fact that those two are even on his spectrum are incredible yeah. to me. Incredible. And, yeah, and what's like, funny is gravity the, kind of feels like a, a fun experiment for him. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, like it's like, oh, you made a masterpiece, but it's like, or you made, you know, this phenomenal film and it's kind of feels like he's yeah. exploring new technologies and a different way of, you know, structuring a story and a performance. And then it's like, oh, but also here's Roma. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Unbelievable. Uh, okay. Quickly, we'll go through uh, the nine Best Picture nominees and winner. Um, nominated, we have The Wolf of Wall Street, Philomena, Nebraska. <laughs> Her, Gravity, Dallas Buyers Club, Captain Phillips, American Hustle yet again, uh, and 12 Years a Slave winning. I mean, I, I mean my, my number one that year, and it's still a movie that I would I absolutely love is Gravity. Yeah, I got to yeah. give it to Gravity. I mean, 12 Years a Slave obviously is, is, a rem, is an incredible film from a filmmaking standpoint. It's beautifully performed. I mean, it's a really tough movie, obviously. Um, but the performances are absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, I got to give it to Gravity. I mean, I think Gravity just because. Not Wolf for either of you two. I'm surprised neither of no, you is arguing for Wolf. I think Gravity is. I think Gravity was. So it's funny. I, I pinpoint moments in my life where, again, this is this is all personal. Right. So moments in my life where films 
pushed the limits and changed the game in terms of how movies are going to be made or or did things that I'd never felt before from an immersion level. One of those I always mention is Dark Knight, um, 70 millimeter IMAX, but Gravity was one of those. And mm. I, I, I got to remind our audience, like that was really where Jake and Sean and I came together to try and start this show years ago because we were so profoundly blown away by what we just watched that we couldn't even comprehend it. We had to go back and talk about it. And I'm not saying 12 Years a Slave didn't lead to conversations. Of course it did. But there was just something about the filmmaking and the immersion of what Koran did with Gravity that I'd never felt before. I'd never seen something like that before. I'd never seen 3D utilized that way. Um, I, just I say never go find seen... that video, but we're all so old now. So no, it's, 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 it's a great video. That frame of reference. Cut, cut to the video, Jake. I think I hate this movie. Yeah. <laughs> if you actually think about it, we were uh, for we were at the end of our day. We had been at TIFF for however long we'd been there. Or we'd just gotten there, whatever. But we had a long Tiff. day of of movies and interviews. The, yeah. whole thing, the only thing we probably should have done is gone back to our rooms and gone to sleep because we had interviews the next day. But we were so like... We couldn't even. And it was like, like an eight or nine it. o'clock start movie. I, I too. Yeah, it was I pretty late. The, the circumstances under I which, like, it. like Sean just came up and was like, "Hey, do you want to come record a?" Like, like these days, we would tell our children, "Don't go back to your hotel room with a strange man in a camera." Like, why? What, what, what the hell <laughs> are we Jesus thinking? Christ. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about gravity. <laughs> come on, guys. Let's go break down gravity. <laughs> I just want to pause for a minute. I laughed when Gabe mentioned Philomena. I don't. I couldn't tell you a thing about Philomena, and it's a Best Picture nominee. Like, I'm. Sure, I'm, I'm sure it's Which a perfectly fine movie. Which is why we need movie. to go back to the five. But Philomena, I mean, has anyone even said I, that I, word it out? It was a really good movie. I, I remember <laughs> seeing it because I remember interviewing the real person. I think that it was based okay. on. This, I, I could be botching this, but this was like years. It was obviously ten years ago. Um, just about. I do remember liking like that de- film. Was she like a detective? Was there like a crime in that? I remember movie? the story. I'm trying it, to dude, think. It, it's been so. I, mean, I just remember. I have a visual memory of of the cast. Or the real person, I think it was coming in studio. Okay. Hmm. Hey, it was a good <laughs> okay. movie, though. I remember being good. So anyway. <laughs> the way that sorry, I was trying to read a read a synopsis. This movie came out in 2013. What is it about but, again? The synopsis uh, is I'm, a movie about Philomena. The, what I'm laughing at <laughs> the way that they the way that they credited this sort of uh, incorrectly because I, I don't think that I, I, maybe she plays this role. But it says in 1952, Irish teenager Philomena Judy Dench <laughs> like she plays the teenager. <laughs> oh, I assume there's a young Judy Dench in this movie yes. unless yes. unless they do something else. Uh, maybe it does deserve my picture if if Judy did. What's the story it. though? Uh, Go ahead and read the plot. She became pregnant out of wedlock and was sent to a covenant. When her baby Anthony was a toddler, the nuns took Philomena's child away from her and put him up for adoption in the United States. For the next fifty years, she searched tirelessly for her son. When That's former right. BBC correspondent oh. uh, Martin Sixsmith, played by Steve Coogan, uh, learns of the story, he becomes her ally. They travel together to America to find Anthony and become That's unexpectedly right. close. Yeah, Coogan was good that. in it. Yeah, Coogan was I good in it. I remember that. that. I do remember that. It was good. It's, a pr- it's, it's, really it's, good. it's fine. Yeah. It's, yeah, I remember that movie. Okay. I think it's a true anyway. story. I'm pretty sure I met the real woman. I yeah, because I, pretty- I, I seem to remember her being there at the Oscars that year. Yes, yes, yes. Well, please All watch right, Blue Jasmine before you watch Philomena. Take us please. out, Sean. That is it. And 2014 Oscars in review. In the meantime, uh, because we crapped all over Madam Web, I want you guys to head to the comment section and tell us what, what you believe is the worst superhero movie ever that you've ever seen or t- and seen, tell us why we're wrong if you really like I've seen, Web. no one no one will do that um i've seen a lot of people say Catwoman. uh i've seen a lot of people say electra electra's a pretty bad movie unfortunately. that whole era of stuff was pretty, yeah, was, that pretty whole era was pretty bad that whole era was pretty bad uh, in the meantime, follow us on social media. As I mentioned before, we're at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. Guys, hashtag if it happens, because it still hasn't happened yet. So, Dune Dunes. Dunes. <laughs> Dunes. <laughs>